This week in Louisiana agriculture, recent rains have broken much of the drought across sugarcane country, but with the rain comes some unwanted characters. I'm AJ Sabine in Thibodeau. I have the latest from a roundtable discussion with farmers and the NRCS. The LSU Ag Center is helping poultry producers grow a better bird. I'm Kristen Oaks and I'll tell you how coming up. Hello, I'm Michael Dana. Thanks so much for joining us. Louisiana sugarcane growers have enjoyed some new successes over the last few years. Louisiana leads the nation in acres of sugarcane in production, while sugarcane growers have seen prices they haven't experienced in more than 20 years. While the drought early in the growing season will likely impact yields come harvest time, the recent rains over the last three weeks has the state's sugarcane crop making a comeback. Rain makes cane, it also makes weeds. So this is a field we uh, sprayed with Roundup before the rains came and uh, it kept it clean for about a week but after the, a week uh, we started getting this one weed nutsedge uh, pop through. For Napoleonville sugarcane farmer Gene Adolph, the rains that fell across his farm over the last three weeks caused his sugarcane crop to jump but it also caused a variety of weeds to cover the fields that will soon be planted with next year's crop, his plant cane. This spray rig is putting out glyphosate, a product that will take care of the weeds like nutsedge, pigweed, and a little morning glory thrown in for good measure. Across the cane belt, growers like Adolf are preparing for planting while keeping an eye on the crop they'll be bringing to market once harvest begins in about six weeks. Uh, the crop has been pretty good this year. We haven't had a, uh, a good infestation of sugarcane borers because we had a dry spring. But uh, on a normal year, uh, or if we have a wet spring, we'll have a, a rise in sugarcane borers and we'll have to spray the crop for, uh, ins with insecticides to uh, control the sugarcane uh, borer. Louisiana sugarcane producers hope to take advantage of a good crop and better than average prices as cane harvest approaches. For Adolf, it will take about six more weeks of walking these fields, checking for pests, and babying this 540 variety cane. And while the 98 degree weather is taking its toll on his mind and spirit, Adolf says all that scouting is also taking a toll on his footwear. These are my former special. I need to retire them probably this week sometime. What's that stuck in there? Is a little morning glory in there? Uh, yeah, yeah, some weeds. I'll just get them out here. <laughs> yeah, let's see, this one's all right. I started in 1996, but I grew up on the farm, but uh, I've never seen prices historically this high, which is a good thing. I can buy me some new tennis shoes. Gene Adolph will take about 450 acres of cane to the Westfield Sugar Mill once harvest begins in about six weeks. Louisiana leads the nation in sugarcane acres in production. Florida is number two, followed by Hawaii and Texas. In the wake of the national debt crisis, Louisiana farmers and ranchers have deep concerns over cuts to the Natural Resources Conservation Service and other USDA programs. As this week in Louisiana Agriculture's A.J. Sabine shows us, farmers voiced their concerns over the budget as well as cuts to the conservation programs at a recent roundtable discussion with NRCS Undersecretary Ann Mills. For years, Iberville Parish sugarcane farmer John Gay has relied on the expertise of the USDA's Natural Resource Conservation Service to help implement conservation measures like pipe drops on his sugar operation. So when he heard that NRCS Deputy Undersecretary Ann Mills wanted to hear from farmers like him during a roundtable discussion in Thibodeau, he headed south. Gay told Undersecretary Mills what he thought about the nation's debt crisis. All of these programs that are uh, handed down through uh, NRCS are, are wonderful and needed and but if we don't have uh, the financial stability to, to keep this government program running as well as all of the other government programs, uh, where will we be in generations to come? That sentiment echoed around the room as farmers and ranchers alike told Mills why NRCS matters to them. Mills, who has managed NRCS since 2009, says programs like Equip will continue despite a tight budget. It's a new world now with a budget, but mm -hmm. I don't think we're going to see EQIP go away. EQIP is one of our strongest, most flexible programs, and obviously we're making the case that investments in EQIP are investments that yield all kinds of benefits. They help the farmer, they help protect our, our soil, our water, our air, 
and uh, they help rural America uh, maintain a robust economy. So it's these kinds of flexible programs that have just have a proven track record that I think we'll be able to make a strong case for. Sugar producer Cecil Ramagas uses NRCS programs extensively. He says rural roundtables like this give farmers a voice. And I think that uh, hopefully she goes back with a better understanding of the problems within the state. Uh, and it's good to be able to talk one-on-one -on -one with, with someone from Washington. Um, as she said, she has 48 hours to report back. Hopefully she doesn't forget what she heard. Mills heard plenty on issues ranging from saltwater intrusion to developing affordable programs for young producers. And although many of the issues raised during the meeting have their own challenges, Mills says the NRCS will partner with landowners to find cost-effective solutions. What we need to do is we need to work with landowners, with scientists, and certainly NRCS is at the forefront of working with both to figure out how can we plant vegetation that's going to help protect those marshes, mm -hmm. uh, how do we manage our water resources, improve the uh, uh, water use efficiency through irrigation to protect our groundwater resources, resources uh, and also to again think about how we can target resources. We can spend money a lot more efficiently if we figure out where the tax dollar is best spent. Because of rural roundtables like this one, Louisiana farmers and ranchers will continue to find a partner with the NRCS. In Thibodeau, I'm AJ Sabine for This Week in Louisiana Agriculture. The NRCS is primarily responsible for working with private landowners in conserving, maintaining, and improving their natural resources. If you'd like more information on the NRCS and its services, you can visit our website at twilatv.org. Well, speaking of federal programs, farmers and some landowners across the state may have to refund farm and disaster payments to the USDA, all because they did not complete a form for the IRS. Louisiana Farm Service Agency State Director Willie Cooper says that form is the Adjusted Gross Income form. Cooper says in 2009 about 6,000 Louisiana farms and landowners failed to file their AGI forms and he says the IRS is missing another 4,000 from 2010. It is significant and I hope the tenants and the other producers uh, will help us to spread that word and we're talking about relatively quick. Now, according to Willie Cooper, this mostly applies to members of limited liability companies and landowners. Cooper says if you did not turn in your AGI form, you're likely to receive a letter reminding you to file it. If you fail to do so, he says the next letter you could receive would be one from the USDA demanding a refund of any farm program or disaster payments you may have gotten. Louisiana's poultry production grossed more than $1.6 billion in 2010 and continues to be the state's number one animal commodity. That's according to the LSU Ag Center. For poultry growers, efficient, state-of-the-art equipment is an essential tool for producing the best results. This week in Louisiana Agriculture's Kristen Oaks discovered how the LSU Ag Center is helping farmers grow a better bird. Sure, the business of growing chickens may seem simple. Feed them, water them, repeat. But ask broiler manager Mark Ware if raising chickens is easy and he'll probably get a good laugh at your expense. The reality of growing a marketable chicken from egg to your kitchen table is an exercise in science. Science the LSU Ag Center is using to simplify the process farmers use to grow their birds. These, these numbers right here are constantly reading. That's where this board tells this board what to do. Ware explains the state-of-the-art heating systems used in the Hill Farms broiler demonstration houses here in Homer. The LSU Ag Center built these two houses last year to improve efficiency and help farmers become more profitable. If I were looking at changing over to a different type of heat, I'd want to have some uh, data to back it up. It's a simple science project. Tube heating versus traditional brooder heaters, keeping all other variables constant. We try to keep the temperature exactly the same, the same number of fans running at the same time with every the cool cells coming on at the same time, at the same temperature, everything as close as we possibly can keep it. For the current project, looking at the two different types of brooders, we're going to be doing that for at least a two-year period. We have completed one year of production and we are just starting our second year of production. Dr. Teresa Laverne serves on the broiler house 
Steering Committee. The committee determines which variables are tested during the experiments, and it also decides how the information gained during these experiments will be used in future applications. We could look at different litter management techniques, different ways of handling litter, different mortality management techniques. We could do product testing. Laverne says these tests could ultimately improve an industry that contributes millions of dollars to the state's economy. If we look at the value of the poultry industry, it is larger than that of the value of all the other animal industries combined. A poultry farmer for nearly 30 years, Ware says the test data he's seen thus far could eventually save farmers money and maximize their output. The tube heat is running more economical and also growing a little bigger chicken and a little better feed conversion consistently. There's not a great difference, but there is. it is consistently better. The difference is simple, a simple science for growing a better bird. In Homer, I'm Kristen Oaks for This Week in Louisiana Agriculture. Now the Hill Farm Broiler House Oversight Committee will meet on August 24th to discuss the project's progress and to consider possible inputs to test in future trial flocks. To find out more about the Broiler Demonstration Project, you can visit our website at twilatv.org. The week of August 7th is National Farmers Market Week. As you saw on Kristen's Ag Minute just a few weeks ago, there are more than 6,000 farmers markets across the country. To learn more about what we'll be doing and what's going on here in Louisiana, we now turn to This Week in Louisiana Agriculture's A.J. Sabine with this week's in-studio guest. A.J. Mike, you know the reasons, one of the reasons why I'm so big and so well grown is because I eat fresh and I eat local. Joining us now to talk more about that and National Farmers Market Week is Copper Alvarez with BREDA and that stands for the Big River Economic and Agriculture Development Alliance. That's right. Right, so you got some, a lot of celebration going on this weekend. We will. We'll kick it off this weekend. Mm -hmm. Mayor Holden should be down to uh, offer a proclamation to recognize Red Stick Farmers Market and eating locally and then we'll have some events there. We'll have have uh, Chef Mike Loop from uh, Capitol Hilton who will mm -hmm. do a farm healthy farm to table menu and that'll be great. People can pick up a farmers market week menu and shop with their favorite farmers. We're going to be making cards for I love the farmers and mm -hmm. we'll give those back to the farmers at the end of the day. So a lot of fun things, great music, great garden uh, activities. And then Thursday, we'll follow up at our Thursday market out on Perkins Road mm -hmm. um, with a canning demonstration. All summer, we've been doing Discover You Can, and we'll have more ways and tips about how to can that great produce we're having right now. And, you know, we were just talking about canning, and I remember uh, as a boy, my grandmother used to can figs and blackberries, and, and now that movement has sort of become a full circle That's here right. in the 21st century. But I want, to t want you to tell folks why uh, terms like locavore have become so important, particularly among the younger generation. Right. Well, I think, you know, USDA a couple of years ago went back to the old know your farmer, know your food mm -hmm. uh, statement. And people really want to know where their food comes from. They think about food safety, they think how is it been grown. And at a farmer's market, you can actually talk to that person that is growing your food. So it is a wonderful thing and locavore just kind of means you support the local guys who are trying to make a living off the land. Mm -hmm. And that helps us be good stewards of our land. Louisiana is fortunate in that we grow 52 weeks a year. And so we have something in season all the time. And the Buy Fresh, Buy Local campaign really believes that if you eat locally, you're gonna be eating seasonally. And then you can wait on those good blackberries in the spring and summer, you know. And uh, unless you can some, like your grandmother used to do. I think the thing that's so impressive about uh, not only the Red Stick Market and the Downtown Market is the fact that you can't, it's not just vegetables and fruits, it's meats, it's uh, shrimp, and everything that, that you can think of right there in a beautiful environment, right. and you're talking to the guy who brought it to you. Right, exactly. Uh, a lot of our farmers and shoppers get to know each other. They notice when someone's missing, if a farmer takes a week off, I get lots of questions. Where are they? Are they okay? Or if shoppers are missing, I hear questions from the farmers. Have you checked on Miss So-and-so? Mm -hmm. Is she doing okay? So they get to build a relationship and really feel comfortable about where their food is coming from. So just to remind folks, next week it's National 
Farmers Market Week, and you guys can uh, check out the Red Stick Farmers Market and the Downtown Market. And where can folks go if they want more information uh, about National Farmers Market Week? USDA has a great website. Farmers Market Coalition has a great website. We'll be putting some things up. In Louisiana now, there are over 40 farmers market and growing more every day. So you should be able to find a farmers market nearby where you can shop locally and get to know the farmer who grows your food. Outstanding. She is Copper Alvarez, the Executive Director of Breda here in Baton Rouge, and we will also have a link to the USD, uh, right. USDA website on uh, Twilight TV. Wonderful. Dot, dot org. Mike, don't forget, next week, buy fresh, buy local. It's filling. You, can, you too can be as big and well-grown as I am. Mike, back to you. Well, thanks, AJ, but I'm going to try to lose a few pounds. Still to come on this week in Louisiana agriculture, it's a part of the poultry industry that saves you lots of money, but something you probably don't know anything about. Kristen Oaks becomes our teacher in her agmen. Stay with us. Weather delayed planting of this year's sweet potato crop, but farmers did manage to get in a crop. The demand for sweet potatoes has been on the rise in recent years. Toby Blanchard reports that Louisiana growers and a new processing facility are working to meet that demand. Sweet potato growers were late getting their crop planted this year. LSU Ag Center sweet potato specialist says it was a challenging planting season for farmers. It was very hot and dry for the majority of our planting season. We actually had to replant about 10% of our acreage. Sweet potatoes need adequate moisture, which was hard to find in spring and early summer. Planting has wrapped up, and Smith says Louisiana has about 14,000 acres of sweet potatoes. Farmers are growing mainly Beauregard, the dominant variety. A new sweet potato processing facility near Delhi is increasing interest among local farmers in growing this tuber. They are beginning to cater some of their production to meet the needs of that new processor. Last fall, ConAgra Foods Lamb Weston opened a facility dedicated to processing sweet potatoes. So far, the operation has met sales expectations, and plant manager Jim Kirkham says it has been a successful first year. LSU Ag Center sweet potato breeders are working on developing a variety that would be better suited for the processing sector. Really, we're working with them to find a different variety that could help in our processing of sweet potatoes and really about getting that consistent quality. The qualities breeders are trying to achieve include a blockier potato with fewer defects and good storing ability. The facility processes around 30 truckloads of sweet potatoes a day, turning them into sweet potato fries. For This Week in Louisiana Agriculture, this is Toby Blanchard with the LSU Ag Center. Last year, Louisiana sweet potato growers produced nearly 4 million bushels of sweet potatoes, which had a farm value of $142 million. Well, as we told you earlier on the program, the poultry industry is the second largest ag commodity here in the state, followed closely by forestry. Joining me now with this week's Ag Minute is Kristen Oaks. And Kristen, I know you know a thing or two about poultry production. Your father is a poultry grower, and I know sometimes it's not a very glamorous business. Mike, I've seen the good, the bad, and a whole lot of the ugly. But no matter how much bad news you hear about the poultry integrators, their practices, it's no doubt that vertical integration is the key factor that turned the poultry business into the most efficient and successful livestock industry in the world. In the business of 21st century meat production, chicken is what's for dinner. But how did this humble little industry have such a mighty rise to the top? Because of vertical integration. During the Great Depression, Jesse Jewell took over his family feed and fertilizer store in Georgia. In a desperate attempt to boost feed sales, Jewell bought baby chicks and supplied them with feed on credit to cash poor farmers. Once the chicks were grown, Jewell bought the birds back at a price that covered his costs and also guaranteed the farmers a profit. Soon Jewell had farmers knocking on his door to contract grow his chickens. In the 40s, he opened his own hatchery, processing plant, and a feed mill. Jewel discovered by owning and integrating every step of the supply chain, he could maximize his profits and produce an efficient product from start to finish. Vertical integration allowed the poultry industry to soar above its competition because it catered to the consumer. 
An efficient product is cheaper for the consumer, and the uniformity of the meat creates product consistency. Vertical integration also allows industries to quickly respond to changing consumer demands and tastes. Poultry has an aggressive new product development and value-added program. If the consumers want it, vertical integration can deliver it. Now Tyson Foods has successfully mastered the economics of vertical integration as they are the number one producer of chicken in the world. Now moving on to Twilight Trivia. Last week our question was which country produces the most mustard seeds and the answer is our neighbor to the north, Canada. For this week's trivia, what is the world's most popular meat for consumption? Is it A, chicken, B, beef, or C, goat? Now all you need to do is log on to our website, twilatv.org, submit your answer, and we'll send one correct entry, a brand new Twila prize pack with some goodies that have been really popular. Stay tuned, we still have a lot more to come on This Week in Louisiana Agriculture. Are you paying more for steak this year? Find out where those prices are going in 2012 on The Bottom Line, coming up. If you're a Louisiana driver and see large round bales of hay being moved west, it's a direct result of the ongoing drought in Texas. Commissioner of Agriculture and Forestry Dr. Mike Strain issued an executive order to relax some of the size restrictions and permit fees for transporting hay. The relaxed regulations will allow vehicles transporting round hay bales to be loaded side by side across trailers up to 12 feet wide and 14 feet in height. Strain says carriers, owners, and drivers are responsible for verifying in advance the actual dimensions and weights. This executive order only covers hay going to ranchers in Texas and is effective through September 30th. Now, the summer heat and drought has drained us all, but none more so than the livestock industry and in more ways than one. Joining us now with this week's bottom line is Neil Malonson. And Neil, when we look at beef stocks, as I understand it, they have not been this low since the 1950s. There, that's correct, Mike, and it's a critical aspect of the industry as well, which is replacement calves, that is the calf crop that will help the nation's livestock herd rebuild. That crop is at its lowest level in 60 years. In its latest USDA cattle on feed numbers, the June 1st calf crop came in at 35.5 million head, a number which hasn't been seen since 1950. If there is a bright spot to this, it's nowhere near as bad as expected by the USDA at the beginning of the year, so at least there's some ranchers out there retaining their calves. Overall, the report showed the smallest national livestock herd in 38 years since we began tracking it in 1973 at just less than 100 million head, 1% than last year. 1.7 million head of cattle went into feedlots in June, which is 4% higher than last year. The bottom line is that the heat and the drought, especially in the south, is driving these cattle to feedlots in record numbers at a time when we're experiencing a shrinking livestock herd. Now, last week I told you that the USDA is expecting a 7 to 8 percent increase in beef prices this year over 2010. While we may get a price break when all of this beef comes to market, eventually it's going to go away and prices will be back up even higher next year. It may also have an effect on grain prices as with less mouths to feed, domestic consumption of corn, beans, and wheat may plunge. That all depends on how much we produce this year, so Mike, it's a wait and see until harvest time. Well, Neil, I know a good steak is a good steak uh, by any other name, but uh, it'll certainly cost you more. Neil Melanson, thanks. And remember, you can listen to any of Neil's reports on the Louisiana Farm Bureau Radio Network. For a list of stations where you can tune in or listen online, click on over to our website, twilighttv.org, and look for the LFB Radio link on the left side of the homepage. That does it for this edition of This Week in Louisiana Agriculture. Join us next week when we'll tell you about some farm and disaster programs which are set to expire this year. Until then, you can watch any of our stories online 24 hours a day. You know the address, twilighttv.org. For all of us here at This Week in Louisiana Agriculture, I'm Michael Dana. Thanks so much for joining us, everybody. Hope to see you again right here next week.